In this video, our subject is death and dying. We will discuss terminal illness and stages of grief, the importance of holistic care to dying people, how to cope with the stress of caring for dying people, how to meet a dying person's physical needs, how to meet a dying person's emotional needs, how to meet the needs of the family, and how to provide post-mortem care. I think of one woman um, I had, she, when she came in, she was in so much pain. She couldn't move, she couldn't eat. Her daughter was about four months pregnant with twins. And she wanted so badly to live to see these babies. But the family had been told that she would only have weeks to live. We worked with her, we got her pain under control. When the pain was under control, she was able to eat, she was able to move. We watched her um, really will herself to get out of that bed, and you know, she lived four or five months. And she was an inspiration to everyone, and um, she wanted so much to um, help others around her too. That was the other amazing thing. She had a roommate who was struggling and was inspired by seeing how well she was doing. Um, she lived not only to see those babies born, they put the babies in her arms and she died two days later. But I, I learned so much about the human spirit and the human will and how we can overcome um, just because of our love for our children or our families or our desire to have a goal that we want to meet, that we can actually postpone our dying. And that's something that I, I have to say too, that even though I'm working with dying patients, they're still alive and they're still living. So we help to make whatever time they have left meaningful for them. Death is the natural end to life. As nursing assistants, we all find ourselves eventually having to care for a dying patient or resident. In the beginning, especially, this can be a difficult situation to face. In this program, we will help you become more comfortable with the emotions associated with caring for a dying person. We will review actions that you, as a nursing assistant, can take to help a dying person and his or her family members, and to let you know you're not alone. We will share with you the personal experiences of others. Many people die suddenly and unexpectedly, for example, as a result of an accident, a sudden illness, or simply from old age. Other people die from terminal illnesses, illnesses for which there is no cure and no hope of recovery. Examples of terminal illnesses include AIDS, some cancers, certain types of heart and lung conditions, and kidney disease. The period of time between when a person is diagnosed with a terminal illness and when the person actually dies varies greatly from one person to another. But at some point, people who are terminally ill will begin to need nursing care. They will begin to need us. Between diagnosis and death, the dying person is likely to experience a wide range of emotions associated with grief. These stages of grief include denial. The person may deny that he is sick or dying. The person may insist that the doctor is wrong and ask to see another doctor. The person may even refuse medical treatment. Anger, another stage of grief, occurs when the person realizes that death is indeed going to occur. Anger may be taken out on the health care team or on family members. If personal habits such as smoking contributed to the disease, there may be anger directed at self. Bargaining is a stage of grief in which the dying person tries to make a deal with someone perceived as having control over his fate, someone such as a health care provider or God. For example, the person might pray to live long enough to witness an event such as a wedding or the birth of a grandchild. Depression is the stage of grief during which the person fully realizes that his illness is certain to end in death, and this knowledge makes the person sad. The person may not want to talk even to family members. The person may cry easily or frequently. 
During the acceptance stage of grief, the dying person accepts that death is coming and is at peace with this knowledge. The person demonstrates acceptance by taking care of unfinished business, such as writing a will or making amends with friends or family members. Once they accept the fact that they are dying, it's then time for us to help the patient accommodate the reality of the loss, um, to talk about the death very honestly and openly. Patients who are dying want people around them to sit with them and to talk to them, to listen to them, and to not pretend or deny the fact that they are dying. Not all dying people progress through all five stages of grief, nor do they necessarily pass through the stages in this sequence. In fact, they may progress through some stages and then return to an earlier stage again, re-entering a state of denial, for example, or becoming angry all over again. Being able to recognize the five stages of grief will give you a better understanding of what your patients or residents and their family members are going through, and that will allow you to provide better care. Remembering the stages of grief will also help you to understand behavior that might not seem fair or appropriate. They may be angry at God, they could be angry at the doctors, they could be angry at family members. Uh, there's anger, and anger is an important part of it too. And my thinking is, you know, if someone's angry with you, maybe that was the outlet they needed and maybe you saved some family member from getting their head chewed off, as it were. It is my goal and my understanding to best allow that to be, to not take it personal, to not counteract their anger and, and get defensive or attack them. Of course they're angry, but um, you can make their last days their good days. You can do that. You have to remember first that the person is maybe acting out of fear or there's some other emotion going on and it isn't personal. You have a therapeutic relationship with the person and um, you can't take it personally even though it may sting a little if someone is angry with you. Sometimes the best thing to do is remove yourself from that situation. You can say, Mr. Jones, I can see that you're upset right now. I'm going to leave for a few minutes and let you calm down, and then I'll be back. Um, again, we use a team approach. You would go to your nursing supervisor, and you might point out, Mr. So-and-so is very angry, and he just said thus and such, and then we'll talk about an approach. Um, I find usually once patients settle down, then they're able to talk about what's really wrong underlying that anger. To, so, to allow them to vent and to allow that anger, uh, but then to acknowledge it with a patient, to say, wow, you know, I, it really is coming across to me that you're feeling angry. You know, is there any way I can help you with this anger? Or why do you feel so angry? Um, and not to say, you know, I know what you're feeling, because we don't. Listen. Listen unconditionally, like a mother would to a child or like a professional boss would to an employee. We nursing um, and, and medical employees need to do that with the patient who is angry at us. They're blaming us that they're dying. And if they can blame us and if we can show that we're understanding of their anger and we're accepting of it, they eventually are able to turn the anger to the right place. A holistic approach to health care focuses on the care of the whole person. It's care that not only meets the person's physical needs, but also his emotional needs. A holistic approach is important when caring for all patients or residents, including those who are dying. This is important to remember because many nursing assistants, especially those new to nursing, compromise the care they give to dying patients or residents without being aware that they are doing so. For example, a nursing assistant might not check in on the dying person as often as he does other people in his care. Or the nursing assistant might be overly cheerful around the dying person. The nursing assistant might provide only the necessary care and then leave the person's room quickly out of fear that the person will want to talk about death. These avoidance behaviors usually occur because the nursing assistant has not yet explored his own feelings about death. If we are to make a full commitment to providing holistic care, we must first explore how we feel about death and dying and strive to become more comfortable with the subject, not hardened to what those in our care mind you, but less timid, more self-confident, in other words, 
more professional. Take it upon yourself to explore the subject of death and dying in greater depth by reading, for example, or by participating in religious or other spiritual activities. And then, at work, take active steps to avoid avoidance behaviors and always try to provide holistic care wholeheartedly. Again, keeping in mind how the dying person feels and focusing on what's best for him or her. Pictures are often a great starting place. Uh, and we encourage families to bring in as many pictures as possible because a lot of times when we walk in as the caregiver uh, all we're seeing maybe is a person who has a certain diagnosis and we tend to forget that there was life before the cancer, there was life before um, the HIV, the AIDS, whatever the person's diagnosis is. So presuming, you know, asking, you know, is it okay, are you up for a visit and a patient says yes, pictures are a great way, like wow, do you mind if I look at your pictures, like who is this that's in these? You know, know this is you and to kind of ask open-ended questions people will do a life review um, they will take a look at what their life has been like and you'll often hear them talking about memories of things as they're getting things tied up and ready to leave I think every one of us wants to realize that we made a difference in life and I suppose we don't often stop and pause and look back at our own lives and see that yes we did make a difference and so many of us may feel we've just done the mundane, average things in life. But when you actually stop and look back and reflect and verbally share that with another person, they can begin to see that their life did have meaning. And it can often bring them to a, a, either a sense of peace about their life, or it may also make them realize that perhaps there's some unfinished business that they needed to address. One of the most important things I've learned throughout the years in nursing, but especially in hospices, that there are times you don't have to say a word. Just being there and keeping your mouth shut is the best place to be. If you give a person permission to talk about things, you would be surprised what they tell you. It's very common, for example, for someone, I have had this experience today, she's been talking to her dead father. Um, it's very common for people as they get closer to death to see deceased loved ones. And a lot of times people may be afraid to tell you something like that because they'll think you're wondering if they're all together. <laughs> but if you give them permission, they'll open up and they will tell you the most heart-wrenching things. Um, her father was literally coming to tell her that he was going to be there and it was time for her to go and this morning she is unresponsive. We believe very much in the power of touch uh, in hospice and especially when people are dying because so often um, I think death can make us fearful of wanting to touch and wanting to you know, embrace somebody. I was um, giving a bath and one of the patients you know, broke down and started crying and told me, you know, I don't, I don't want to die and um, I just went to him and held him and I comforted him. We always encourage uh, or always ask first permission. Is it okay if I hold your hand? Um, and we also, um, we were kind of told way back and we kind of pass that on to people now that um, always place your hand under um, a patient's hand. And that still allows the patient to be in control and to have the independence. And if they feel they've had enough of holding the hand, they can gently slide that hand away. Um, and it also, you know, gives them again uh, that independence to still be in control and that's so important that we always maintain their independence and for some of our patients that could be the last bit of independence they have is choosing to let you continue to hold their hand or to take that hand away. Many people become uncomfortable, even depressed when faced with situations involving death or dying. Perhaps you feel that way too. Like me, you probably entered the healthcare profession in order to help people get well and recover. And maybe that's why when we provide care to someone we know is certain to die, we somehow feel like we've failed. We feel powerless, perhaps even useless. We may even feel stress or depression, both in our work and in our personal lives. I know my husband and I joke a lot about, uh, he hears people say to him, your wife must be a saint where she works. Oh, that must be so awful, so depressing. It is the least depressing job I've ever had. Uh, a good day for me is when I leave 
and I know that people are sleeping and pain-free and their families are happy. Yes, it's very hard um, to come in every day knowing that they're going to die, that they're not going to be here much longer. Um, I come in and sometime knowing that I will go to the room, I, I would look. First thing I focus on is the room. If I'm coming through the door and they're in like room 400 and I know that, I look to see if they're there and then just go, hmm, another day. So another day that we have Mrs. Smith, you know, and let's see what we can do. Um, it's hard. I think if it got too easy and you lose your emotions, you shouldn't be in hospice. Uh, many times I've stood with families and staff and cried with them. And there's no embarrassment. I feel that if the day comes where I don't, then I leave. I take a little time out, maybe about every three or four months, I take some time off. I have things that I like to do. I happen to sing in a choir. I have a group of friends that go out once a month and do something fun. Do something that you enjoy and that's relaxing for you. You know, I think an important part is, is encouraging, um, well, all of us, but particularly people who are dealing with death and dying, to have their own uh, support systems in place. Um, you know, to check our own burnout signs and, and uh, to have something that allows us not necessarily to take all this home with us because uh, we obviously can't do that, but that if some of it does follow us home, to have something in place um, that helps us to keep balance so that we can come back in the next day and do this all over again. We, we know when to give each other a break. In fact, Debbie and I are about ready to switch the group of patients we have because we know this one particular patient is really tough and she drains you. And we know that on Sunday we will be switching groups, so we already have that planned. And we also have um, team meetings where we can get together and we can talk about, we open our team meeting with a prayer and we can remember the patients that we took care of that have died in the week. And know that it's okay sometimes to cry. It's okay to cry with a patient or a family. I mean, you have feelings and it's okay to express them. Caring for a person who is dying can and will affect you. If the feelings you are experiencing threaten to have a negative impact, consider taking a coffee break, a short, vigorous walk, or a few moments to talk about your feelings with a trusted coworker. Taking advantage of counseling services offered by your employer or confiding in a clergy member or trusted colleague can also help you to work through the emotions you may feel when facing the loss of a patient or resident. Providing basic physical care for people who are dying promotes comfort and helps them to feel that they are not alone. As death approaches, however, a dying person becomes increasingly more dependent on others for physical care. Even though a person's hearing is likely to remain sharp until the time of death, the person may have difficulty speaking and may therefore be unable to express her wishes clearly. As the person's ability to communicate pain, thirst, or other physical needs diminishes, she will rely more and more on the nursing team to anticipate those needs and to take care of them. Physical care for a dying person includes care of the skin and mucous membranes, positioning, and other comfort measures. More frequent skin care and linen changes are needed because of urinary or bowel incontinence and because of the moist skin that often occurs as the person nears death. Clean the person's skin gently. The mucous membranes of the nose and eyes may also become dry and mucus crusts may form. Gently removing the dried mucus with a warm, wet washcloth can help keep the person comfortable. Frequent mouth care helps keep the mouth moist and is especially important if the person is not taking food or drink. Check the person regularly for incontinence of both urine and feces and change soiled linens or clothing promptly. Positioning is also important. As death approaches, the person may not be able to reposition effectively without help. Frequent, regular position changes promote comfort and help to prevent pressure ulcers. If the person is in pain, be extra gentle and slow with position changes. Consider other comfort measures. Soft music, back massage, and being read to can help the person rest and feel better. Keep the room well lit and ventilated. Remember, 
all people have the right to die peacefully and with dignity. And this means we must respect their final wishes whenever possible. A person who has made the decision to receive only supportive care at the end of her life will have a no code or a DNR, do not resuscitate order, written on her chart. Make sure you know what the person's wishes are regarding end of life care and respect those wishes. Many people have fears related to death and dying. They may anticipate feeling great pain. They may fear embarrassment due to loss of bodily control, for example, or because of their loss of independence. They may fear leaving things undone, goals unattained, projects uncompleted, pets or loved ones left uncared for. Perhaps the greatest fear people have with regard to death and dying is that of dying alone. As a nursing assistant, you can help to relieve some of these fears simply by spending time with the person and reassuring her that she is not alone. Sometimes the person will want to fight loneliness by talking and you can meet the person's emotional needs simply by being a good listener. Other times, the person will not want to talk but will be comforted just knowing that you are nearby. Use your skills of observation to determine whether someone prefers to talk or to remain silent. The spiritual feelings that people experience when faced with death will vary greatly from person to person. Many people are comforted by their spiritual or religious beliefs and by anticipation of an afterlife. Sometimes they will offer insight into their faith or beliefs. Listen without being judgmental. Do not try to change the person's perspective. Many people who are dying will want to talk to you about their decisions regarding supportive care and life-sustaining treatment. For example, some people may want everything possible done to save their lives. Others will prefer to avoid aggressive treatment and instead will just request supportive care. The emotional support you provide when you listen to the person and the respect you pay to the person's end-of-life decisions are a very important part of providing holistic care. Oftentimes, families are in as much emotional pain as the person who is dying. In fact, family members often go through the same stages of grief as the dying person. There are many simple things you can do to comfort the family of a dying person. Ensure good communication between the family members and the health care team. Uh, Dad is feeling a little more pain today. Is there any more we can do for him? I'm not sure. Let me find a nurse for you and she can answer a question. Okay. I'll be right back. Julie, thanks for everything you're, you're doing. Welcome. Relaying family members' questions and concerns promptly to the appropriate members of the health care team helps reassure family members that quality, compassionate care is being provided to their loved one, thereby lessening their worries. Allow the family to stay with the dying person and participate in the person's care as they wish. Family members often derive great comfort from participating in the care of a dying loved one. Can I do that? Oh, sure, great. Okay. Hey. Let's try a little ice, okay? Ensure that the family's basic needs are met. Simple acts of kindness, such as ensuring that there are enough chairs in the room for visitors, help to reduce stress. Be available to provide care to the person without intruding on the family. Sometimes the difference between being available and becoming a nuisance is very slight. Be sensitive to the needs of the family during a time when privacy can be very important. As a bereavement counselor, I would consider the role of the nursing assistant to be very crucial in the point of talking with the family members, educating the family members on the stages of death and dying and to help uh, really gauge the family member to understand where the family member is at with acceptance and help the family member move on to working through the tasks of grief and accepting the reality of the death. Sometimes they just need their hug and they need the reassurance that you're doing the right thing for their mother or their father. That's usually the problem. Sometimes they think that their mother or father is not getting the best of care. You have to reassure them that you are giving the best of care. If, she, if they have any problems, they talk to us and we'll tell them we'll take care of it. And um, 
usually we do and if they have um, problems that we can't deal with then we ask them to speak with the manager but uh, most of the time whatever they need they talk to us and it's pretty well met. Eventually, you will experience the death of one of your patients or residents. At such times, you must remain focused on those in your care, both the person who has died and the loved ones left behind. Post-mortem care, that is, care given after the person has died, should continue to center around maintaining the privacy and dignity of the deceased and the family members, even as you pay close professional attention to proper health care procedures. If you are present when one of your patients or residents dies, immediately notify the nurse and note the time. After the doctor has pronounced the person dead, you may be required to help the nurse prepare the body for the family to view before sending it to the morgue or funeral home. Post-mortem care is necessary to keep the body in proper alignment and to prevent skin damage and discoloration. You will show respect for the deceased and the family by working quietly and preserving the person's dignity even after death. Be aware that cultural and religious beliefs often will dictate how the body is to be cared for after death and by whom. Procedures will also vary depending on the policies of your institution and the requirement for an autopsy, which is an examination of the dead person's organs and tissues. If an autopsy is to be performed, medical devices such as tubes, drains, and intravenous lines are not to be removed during postmortem care. To prepare a body for the family to view, first straighten the bed linens, or if they are soiled, be sure to change them. Clean the body, remembering to follow standard precautions because bodily fluids are still potentially infectious even after death. Dress the person in a clean gown or pajamas. Rigor mortis is the stiffening of the muscles that usually develops within two to four hours of death. Once rigor mortis occurs, it becomes difficult to reposition the body. For this reason, it is especially important to proceed without significant delay. Position the person in a natural position on the bed and draw the top sheet up to the person's shoulders, cuffing it neatly. Do not cover the person's face with the sheet, as this can be very disturbing to family members. Dispose of your gloves and wash your hands. Make sure that the room is neat and dim the lights so that the atmosphere in the room is calm and peaceful and to avoid harsh, morbid shadows on the person's face. Continue to make yourself available to assist the family without intruding, however, upon their need for privacy. As you can see, Caring for a person who is dying is by far one of the most challenging situations you will face. As a nursing assistant, you will play a supportive role during this difficult time. Your understanding of your own thoughts about death and dying will greatly influence your ability to provide care to a dying patient or resident and to family members. Think about how you would want to be cared for if you were dying. What actions could the nursing staff take that would let you know that someone cared for you? If you were alone with no family to visit or help care for you, what might help you fight off loneliness and depression? Thinking about these questions can help guide the care you will give to others during this very important final stage of life. My number one priority in providing care is to provide the best care. You, doing this job, you have to remember that they are people and you will one day be in their shoes, so you have to remember that. The, how would you want it if you were elderly? How would you want to be taken care of? You have to remember that. If you don't care and you don't have the heart, then you don't belong on hospice. But I always say that everyone that's on hospice are special people in a team, but it takes special people to do that. You know, everybody can't do that. So. I mean, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I think I'm special because I've been there so long. <laughs> and I do care. It's actually exceeded my expectations. Um, 
not only have I learned about the process of dying, but it teaches you a lot about living and changing your priorities, the things that are really important in life. Hospice nurses are not hired, they are called, and I truly believe there is a higher calling. Whatever um, one believes in, as far as a creator or spiritual sense, I, I feel that we're called because it's definitely not for everyone. For me, my belief system is that death is a transition. It's not an end. And if I can do something to make someone's passage uh, more comfortable, then I feel good about what I've done. And um, I think it's an excellent career choice myself. Mm, I chose this career and I'm glad I did. You know, it has changed me a lot. It's making me aware of people in general and um, how important it is to help people that really need help. We received a resident not too long ago and when they first brought her to the unit they said she wasn't expected to live long but she went from not eating to eating, not talking too much but now she talks all the time. You can't stop her. And I feel like our our care as GNEs really pushed her to do that because she wouldn't do it for her own family, but she did it for us. Well, if you think about it, you are being given the privilege of working with people at the end stage of their life. And I approach it as if it was myself, if it was a family member that I loved in that bed, how would I want that person taken care of? You are being given the responsibility of helping that person to be comfortable and you want to be dependable and know that you're a very valued member of the team and it's a team approach. We support each other in the job. Um, we will talk about patients together and, and talk about problems together and we each depend on each other to get the job done. <laughs>